talk about three specific methods today. Um, they allow us to measure specific optical effects from a given data set without requiring access to the microscope. And uh, then considering these effects during refinement uh, produces better reconstructions. So uh, all of this uh, I've done at the LMB with uh, Shores Scheres and Takanori. So all of this will be available to the public very soon as with the next release of Relyon uh, 3.1, possibly next month already. So the specific effects that I will talk about are um, uh, two types of higher order aberrations, symmetrical and anti-symmetrical ones, and anisotropic magnification. Um, so let's begin with, uh, with the aberrations. So in order to explain this, I'll have to go through some very simplified optics. So uh, in a TEM, uh, when an electron passes through our very thin sample, most of the electron does not scatter, it just passes right through. One small fraction of it scatters and essentially performs a Fourier transform of the image that it sees. Um, so that for every uh, 2D spatial frequency k in the image, there is a corresponding ray uh, moving that direction with that amplitude and phase. Uh, there are no discrete rays, of course, unless we look at crystals. It's a continuum of rays. And further below, uh, there are lenses, or one lens, that serves to refocus the scattered rays. And now if we uh, had a perfect lens, which we don't, and if we uh, used it to take an image in focus, then all those scattered rays would, would arrive in phase. That is, uh, the ones traveling through the middle would be slowed down by the lens just enough so that the ones from the, on the outside can catch up, just like on a glass lens. Um, however, and although if, even those, all those uh, scattered rays would be in phase with each other, they would still exhibit a sl uh, small phase shift versus the unscattered uh, ray. And that, is, uh, that would give us a small amount of contrast, and that's what uh, material scientists would work with. In cryo-EM, we of course like to take images out of focus. And then if the, if the scattered rays are in phase down here, then they can no longer be in phase up there. So because they all have different phases compared to each other, uh, their, their phase shift, their phase delay versus the uh, unscattered ray uh, varies. And this is what gives rise to our CTF. However, in the peaks and the troughs of the CTF, we obtain about 15 times higher contrast this way. Uh, right. Um, and uh, this phase delay phi is what we'll, I will uh, refer to as the aberration or the phase delay. Now, another very important property is Friedel symmetry. So because the image that the electron sees is real valued, so we model it that way, uh, its Fourier representation uh, exhibits this symmetry. That is, uh, the complex amplitude at uh, spatial frequency k is the composite conjugate of that at minus k. So the uh, absolute amplitude is symmetrical, the phase is anti-symmetrical. Now, if uh, the rays corresponding, the scattered rays corresponding to k and minus k are delayed by different amounts, this breaks Friedel symmetry. Now, this does not make us see imaginary numbers, unfortunately, because the, the image arises from the interference between the scattered and the unscattered rays. But what it does it, uh, it sh is it shifts the, um, the phases of the respective image waves, so frequencies k. Um, and the most common way uh, situation we will see this is under a tilted beam, but it's not the only situation. So here an example. To the left you see a simulated example of a beta gel. Um, on the left, you see the undistorted image, and on the right, you see how the uh, very high frequencies are shifted very much to the right, while, while the lower frequencies remain unimpaired. Um, right, so what we can always do is we can uh, split the phase delay up into a symmetrical component, which is just the average of the two sides, and an anti-symmetrical component. And now the symmetrical component produces the CTF, and the anti-symmetrical one uh, in introduces a new uh, phase shift. Now, this is just for the O into tradition. You, I mean, at some point we've defined the CTF to be a real valued function, so the phase, ang phase shift has to be treated separately. We could also think of the phase shift as the phase angle of the CTF, but we don't. However, um, because the effects are different, we have to estimate these two separately and treat them separately. So, um, um, until now, in rely on 3.0 at least, uh, for the CTF, we used only these three effects, um, basis functions, so we have a constant phase shift or amplitude contrast term, a quadratic uh, astigmatically focused term with three degrees of freedom, and a radial asymmetrical fourth order term for the spheric aberration. These are the only five uh, degrees of freedom for this traditional CTF. And on the anti-symmetrical side, we've introduced uh, 
uh, beam tilt for Reliant 3.1. Uh, 3.0. In Reliant 3.1, we will allow for arbitrary Zelnica polynomials in both columns. Now, more importantly than uh, the fancy new model, these are the, the polynomials, by the way. Um, there's nothing very special to them. We don't use their orthogonality. But so, so they um, come in uh, even and odd bands, which are uh, either anti-symmetrical or symmetrical. Um, the frequency increases, as does their number, and they come in pairs. So by um, constructing linear combinations of corresponding functions, we can rotate them into any angle. Um, these are the ones that we have considered so far. Uh, these two are just describe the shift of the particle, and the true position of the particle is unknowable, so we don't really care about these. Uh, right. Now, more important than uh, the model, of course, is that uh, we now have methods to estimate these, the coefficients corresponding to these Zelnica polynomials. Um, all of these methods, or both of these methods, uh, require only one um, scan through the data, which takes on the order of one hour, uh, usually less, and uh, then the uh, Zelnik polynomials are fitted and can be used in the next refinements. Uh, because these are refinement methods, we require a previous 3D map that has been obtained without knowing these effects, uh, and all the angles and the foci and everything that allows us to uh, uh, make a prediction uh, that corresponds to every observed particle image X. So. Uh, here an example, to scale, by the way, just to remind you. Um, so this is the signal that uh, we predict, and that's supposed to be hidden in this uh, polished image here. So you see the two dark dots, if you look carefully. Maybe don't. It's... And, and remember the, number, the letters, by the way. I'll always call, I'll refer to the, ref the prediction as V and to the experimental image as X. So, uh, to come clean here, the anti-symmetrical aberrations are essentially the same as the beam tilt estimation in Reliant 3.0, just with a different model. But it's the simplest of the three methods that we'll be talking about today, so I'll use this as an entry point. Um, so for the anti-symmetrical aberrations, we would like to represent an uh, angle field, um, one angle for each uh, Fourier pixel k, as a linear combination of anti-symmetrical Zelnica polynomials. And these are the unknowns, these red uh, letters. Uh, and then these uh, phase angles produce uh, phase shifts, that's just uh, numbers in, on the unit circle in the complex plane, that when multiplied to the predicted images, uh, rotate them as closely as possible in least square sense to the complex amplitude of the, uh, in the observed images. And this uh, is to be minimized over all particles and all frequencies. Now the problem with this is that it's of course uh, for one nonlinear, and for the other, we, we would like to always have millions of particles, if possible, with uh, hundreds of thousands of pixels each. So doing this nonlinearly, iteratively, would be prohibitive, especially because the particles are all stored on disk and would have to be loaded over and over and again. Instead, we can do something much more elegant. Uh, we can reorder the terms, and when we put all of the terms corresponding to one given frequency k together, we see that uh, the r is the same for all of them. And uh, it's, it's a sum of quadratic functions, which we can reduce to one single such quadratic function, which is defined by its uh, vertex, its uh, minimum, Q, and its weights, or curvature, W. Also an absolute offset, but this is ignored here because we only look for the minimum. And now when we minimize this over all the frequencies, um, this, is, this can be done trivially in fractions of a second, nonlinearly. Uh, it produces the same minimum as that, uh, this year. It's not an approximation. And uh, these numbers here, the blue ones, these we can estimate uh, or compute by just scanning through the data once. We load each particle from disk and uh, make the corresponding prediction. For the, for the weights, we just add up the, the uh, squared amplitudes and for the Q, the correlations. And then, then we have it. But uh, more important than making this, the problem tractable this way uh, is uh, we can also inspect the per pixel optimal phase shifts. So these Q are, again, numbers in the complex plane, somewhere close to the unit circle. And when we look at their phase angles, we usually see the signature of, of a beam tilt. That is a, a positive phase shift on one end and a negative one on the other, and a cubic growth in between. But in some cases, we actually see more interesting things. 
uh, like these uh, trefoil operations. This is the most extreme case, and we'll be looking at that a little more. Um, or another trefoil, and this thing that might be a secondary coma, but it's a little hard to tell. And uh, with our new Zernike model, we can now uh, express this quite well. So in this case, it's specifically these uh, trefoil terms. So th these are the beam tilt terms in the third, uh, third order. And now, as when we consider these, we can also uh, fit something that looks like this, which becomes positive three times and negative three times. Right. Um, all right, so the anti-symmetrical operations were already known. For the symmetrical ones, this is a uh, new territory. I have done something similar. Um, but here we try to find, oh, first off, uh, until now we have uh, used this CTF, which is uh, just a negative sign of some phase delay gamma, which consists of these three terms, a constant, a uh, quadratic, and a fourth order one. Note there are no linear or third order terms because uh, it has to be symmetrical. And now, right here uh, on the diagram, See the phase shift, one term, then three defocus terms, and again, one spherical operation term. Um, so now, it, it makes sense to estimate these low order terms uh, per particle or per micrograph in some situations very often. Uh, so we don't want to touch the old CTF. We only want to add one uh, offset, which is global or partly global, constant for one big chunk of the data set. Um, and this is based on the expectation that uh, the higher order operations change more slowly than the lower order operations. That is something that microscopy people seem to think. Uh, I have no experience with it. Uh, but now we, we look for a constant such offset while this here varies. Right, and here again, um, we want to minimize a square loss. Now the CTF is unknown. And it's very much nonlinear because uh, this thing is in the sign here. I mean, this is the phase delay delta, which is a linear combination of now symmetrical Zernike polynomials. And uh, yeah, we want to find the optimal such coefficients d, which uh, gets gets the v's as close to the x as possible, x's as possible. Why does that say no CTF? Oh, well, there's no CTF in the v. Uh, the prediction is made without us um, modulating it with the CTF because we are, we are looking for the correct CTF to multiply to this. That's all. <laughs> the X already contains the CTF, of course, because... Right, and what we can do now is just apply a basic trigonometric identity and transform the sum inside the sine into a linear combination of the sines and cosines. But note that the lower-order terms are known here, so it's... Uh, but just uh, redefining the sine and the cosine over unknown delta as our new unknown, our new per pixel unknown t, uh, we can transform a nonlinear one dimensional problem per pixel into a uh, linear two dimensional problem. And we can go back and forth between uh, the t and the delta, of course. Right, so now our CTF is uh, something linear. We can plug it in here and. Uh, you know, put all of, all of these coefficients on one side. We see this is, oops, this is really a, a linear problem for a given k, and more specifically, we can. Uh, it's again a sum of parabolas, but now in two dimensions, two real dimensions instead of one complex dimension. But it is a actual difference because the weights become anisotropic. So again, we reorder the terms. We put everything together that belongs to a given k, so that the t is the same. The phase shift for a given. Um, for a given frequency pixel k, the shift in the CTF has to be the same for the old, for the entire data set, no matter what the actual phase of the CTF is for, is for a given particle. Uh, and now, when we group these together, we can again transform them into one single quadratic uh, expression, uh, where the weight is now a uh, symmetrical two by two matrix, so it's anisotropic. And the uh, TKs, in order, to, in order to obtain those, we don't divide by the weights, but instead we uh, invert this symmetrical two-way two matrix. But it's essentially the same, just in, in two dimensions. And like before, um, just, we just need to iterate through the data set once. It can be the, uh, the same iteration as the previous one. And we just sum up uh, what these Ws and Bs for each K. 
uh, that is the the weights and the um, well, the things that will then produce uh, the optimal phase shifts for each pixel. And once we have that, we can optimize this non-linearly again within uh, fractions of a second. Right. And like before, uh, <clears throat> we can also look at the actual per pixel optima, the optimal per pixel phase shifts. And in this case, that's the same data set as uh, the one before, um, the, the one with the very strong aberration. And here we see that the uh, true CTF is uh, running ahead of the expected one in four directions and lagging behind it in four other directions. And this uh, can be expressed by our Zanike model again. And when we look at the corresponding CTFs, so here we see the original one and uh, the distorted one. So note it becomes slightly angled up here. But there's very little change um, around the origin. So you could never measure this by just looking at ton rings. Those are way too weak. You need to accumulate the data for an entire data set to, uh, to estimate those. So um, this actually does make, the, make a difference in some cases uh, when it really is a problem. We found uh, this is the most extreme data set I've found, uh, this proteasome where we start with 3.3 uh, 3 .3 angstrom, and then by correcting both the symmetrical and the anti-symmetrical aberrations, we can get all the way to 2.5. Right. OK, uh, now the anisotropic, anisotropic magnification. This is related. Um, yeah, I'm, I assume you're familiar with it. Microscopes sometimes magnify to different degrees in different directions. So the, the image that we observe is uh, uh, contracted or dilated compared to the uh, uh, true one. Uh, however, the reference map that you obtain, the particles of the sample, we can, I think, always assume that the, the in-plane rotation angle is completely arbitrary. Um, so that uh, the 3D projections of the 3D reference map will never show any endosotropic magnification, or uh, no significant one. So we can uh, compare, again, compare the predictions with the observed images. And try, in this case, the approach is to try to find shifts, there's translations for every, every pixel. Again, every pixel in Fourier space. You can express the stretching and squishing of an image in Fourier space on, or in real space. It's the same. The matrix is just inverted. Uh, and ultimately, we then expect these shifts to line up along a linear manifold, if this is really a stretching or squishing that you're observing. And uh, formally, what we do is now uh, we can have this reference. Now, again, without the CTF, it's, it's on the outside. Uh, and we want to find small uh, displacement vectors delta, delta k, at k, for each k, so that uh, we can minimize this square loss. And now, to make this uh, nicely linear again, we perform a Taylor expansion. This is an approximation, of course, now. And uh, so we assume that uh, the value, the complex amplitude of the predicted image um, at k plus delta k is equal to v at k plus uh, the gradient of v at k dot the displacement delta k. And when we do that and plug it back in here, it's all nicely linear again, uh, like in the previous case. So we again just need to iterate through the data set once, accumulate uh, a symmetrical two by two matrix, that's just three distinct numbers and a two vector. So it's five vectors, uh, five, five numbers per pixel altogether that we need to track as we go through the data set. And when we're done, uh, we can determine this, these displacements at first. And when we look at them, uh, was, you can probably see it better over there. Um, so you do see that it, they do, uh, so here you see the two components of the per pixel displacement. And uh, you see how they do line up uh, along linear manifolds. Uh, and if you interpret that together with the coordinates, it means that the x direction is, the x coordinate is squished and uh, the y uh, direction is stretched and at a slight angle. Right, uh, and now these displacements are not use useful, of course. They just tell us that there is the magnification. Uh, we can, instead of estimating these per pixel displacements, we can just estimate one magnification matrix M. So we, uh, we want to find the matrix that, when applied to the coordinates in Fourier space, gives us new coordinates that are similar to uh, k delocalized by delta k. Right? And this is, again, a per, uh, nicely linear. 
and we don't need to do anything new. We just uh, we have all the terms that we need, uh, from assuming we've computed the delta case. So uh, we can solve this in uh, fractions of a millisecond, probably, because it's nicely linear. It's just a uh, it's just four unknowns that we are looking for. And that's that's it then. And we have the this M. We can. Uh, uh, Reliant is now aware of it, and then there's never any need to uh, to resample images as people used to do. We just Reliant just needs to know where to uh, insert uh, a pixel in in the 3D volume. Um, also, another caveat: uh, the M is I have defined it as as general as possible. It's a really a general two-way two matrix, so it's not necessarily symmetrical. So it cannot necessarily be exp uh, expressed as a just two magnifications and an angle in between, but it can also have a skew component. Uh, this is known for light cameras. Uh, uh, we have seen no evidence that it actually happens in cryo-EM, but uh, Reliant would support it. Uh, and if you like, if you would like a symmetrical matrix, you can symmetrize it. And the results of this are consistent with uh, more traditional methods. However, this can be done uh, after collection, so you don't need uh, access to the micro microscope. Uh, to do it. It only helps, however, if there is significant anisotropy, and that is rare. Um, what it also does, however, is it allows us to um, estimate the relative magnifications in a heterogeneous data set. So sometimes people will merge uh, images collected on different microscopes on, or on the same microscope after alignment, so uh, the magnification is maybe nominally the same, but in reality it varies by a couple of percent. And with this method, you can uh, now estimate the, the relative magnifications of the different sub data sets. And finally, uh, it's, it's the last, bit, last thing that one can do. It usually produces a small improvement, but because there usually is some little bit of anisotropy. Mm, so with this together, we can now approach what we shouldn't report as 1.5, but uh, <laughs> we can approach the highest resolutions that we've measured so far. Soft reach. Right, uh, also on a more practical side. Um, so now we, it's maybe not too interesting to this audience actually, but uh, we support a new concept of uh, optics groups now. So uh, all the optics, optical, optics related quantities only need to be constant within one such optics group. But we can now refine data coming from uh, different microscopes with different voltages even. Uh, and all of them can be refined together. And we can use the anisotropic magnification estimation to estimate the relative magnifications of the sub-optics groups. And the second thing, uh, there is now also a new uh, a per micrograph global estimation procedure for the remaining low order CTF terms that, we, uh, um, I, haven't, that I haven't talked about very much. Um, so with this, you can now estimate uh, the phase shift, the defocus, the astigmatism, the spheric aberration, and the per particle B and scale factors. Uh, each of them either per micrograph or per particle or not at all. That is leaving them fixed. Right. Thank you very much for your attention. And please ask your questions now.